Uh, three, two, one, go. Hello, everybody who's here, which is just us, and everybody who's watching later, which is also probably just us, if we're being honest. Uh, and to... some, some, some friends we've roped into. We, we, yes. we, we have hijacked the aux cord. It's like, we're, you're going to listen to two white guys discuss feminist philosophy, and you're going to like it. <laughs> I feel like we can't force that last one, but you can force that at least to, to, to we'll talk about language. Um, yeah, this is going to be just a, 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 a non- a uh, sequitur kind of meeting a where we get together in sort of kind of like in honor of Women's History Month a little bit. We may have something coming up for uh, a, a different time in March uh, that uh, has to do with philosophy of feminism. But this time we did decide because we had nothing else planned to just have an impromptu conversation about uh, feminist philosophy. No one else showed up to the meeting. So it's just going to be Daniel and I. We are uh, respectively uh, the treasurer and president of Philosophy Club. In, in this guerrilla form, so we have, have no positions uh, formally. Anyway, we're it's, just going to riff for a while about it, some stuff. It's that an I've extremely been doing. fun time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in the immortal words of, of Bill Nye, who better to talk about sex and gender than two cis male white guys? Exactly. And I, and I do such a good job as the treasurer, especially because I don't make 70 cents on the dollar. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. That was a low-hanging joke. I apologize. That the, y- y- y'all deserve better quips than that. You're not getting them. The thing is, we make <laughs> no money on the dollar. Uh, so yeah, the we're just gonna we're just gonna do a thing. Um, I, I there's the topic that I I wanted to sort of bring into it. Uh, can start with I think um, the the piece by uh, uh, Mary Kate McGowan, which is oppressive speech. Uh, which I believe is uh, publicly accessible at this point. This came out of, uh, in something like 2009, 2010. Uh, so it's uh, a, a sort of an essay paper uh, by McGowan exploring like the way uh, conversations operate as conversations and other social structures operate as like rule governed activities and how people speaking in those rule governed activities, like literally speaking, uh, can not just cause things to happen by way of uh, making people think things, but cause, but uh, sorry, but be actions in themselves. Like your, our, our speeches, our, our words can be uh, actions which do a thing uh, directly is the idea uh, that have to do with these rule governed activities that conversations constitute and therefore can constitute oppression, right? So we're talking about um, the way in which speech can not just cause oppression in a sort of global sense, but be oppression in the immediate sense of, you know, being an act of, of aggression against. In this case, we're considering just historically marginalized communities, such as in this, for our purposes, women, I guess. Uh, I mean, you, that's you not guess. A, that's not wrong, I mean, maybe. Line, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I know insofar as I can know anything, basically. Uh, but I, I say, I guess, just because that's one example uh, in, in, in the conceptual framework that McGowan is developing of a marginalized community. It, uh, it applies to, even to uh, uh, like very specific marginalized communities, like, like the lowest rung on the corporate ladder, if you, if, if you will, uh, in, in some settings and in other settings, not that. Uh, but yeah, so, it, so it, it generalizes well, but we, can, but we can discuss it just in terms of, of, of feminism and that sort of that political fight, that political interest. Uh, and what's, yeah, um, that's pretty much, that's kind of what I hope to sort of set up and, and discuss uh, because an interesting conceptual question comes up in, in the, the way in which uh, words can in themselves be actions. I'm, 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 try, I'm going to try and sort of in real time parse out this concept and see if I can uh, challenge it in some meaningful way. Not to- And I'm undo- going to help and- <laughs> Yell comments from the peanut gallery. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, this this for the, for the benefit of the audience. This is a class uh, philosophy and feminism, and a title I still take issue with. Uh, <laughs> that maybe is, that's what we should talk about because that is oh that I, I I still <laughs> I completely get the title. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I get it. anyway. Uh, that is not what you're you're not taking this from me, Daniel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the 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 class is philosophy and feminism. And uh, Daniel has taken it before, 
I'm taking it now with the same professor. As far as we know, it's mostly the same material. Um, so theoretically, he may have, uh, not the, I mean, probably, uh, yeah. he's familiar with these this same stuff that I'm talking about as well. It's um, it's hard for me to remember names and attach names to ideas. It was very, very just in general, not just in philosophy, across all of academia. So it's extremely likely that I read this, that was assigned and led the lecture material on this and everything. But I mean, like I'll be I'll be honest, it's just a man of fricker. That that I mean that that's really like the only like feminist philosophy like name can definitively attach to idea. Mm. Um and yeah, that's only just because her idea is the best one. But that's a topic for another time. Yeah, uh, honestly, I, I wonder in that case if, if our professor has updated the material because we went into, uh, as in addition to that, uh, some expansive material on that built off of, of Fricker's idea of epi uh, testimonial, not testimonial justice. Uh, epistemic. Epi epistemic, you were right. Yeah. It was the first word. Testimonial justice is one of the kinds of epistemic yeah. justice. Yeah, uh, we, so we went into material that was like building off of it, showing how her model is like insufficient to describe X kind of cases and, and it's sort of, you know, not uh, deconstructed and built it back up better uh, was, yeah. the, was the idea. Yeah. Um, Amanda Fricker obviously did like the, the I, I, well, did she do the pioneer? I don't actually know historically whether or not her work is like the pioneering example. Anyway, this is McGowan. Um, um. Uh, bef before we get before we get to McGowan, actually, just sort yeah. of answer some, some of the, those those things. That is how the class proceeded when 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 I took it. You know that is that is to, oh, okay. to, to my memory how that how that functioned. And you know this is from you know when this is from epistemology with with Dr. Carey. But when he talked about epistemic injustice, what he said was, it is probably false to say that no one talked about epistemic injustice before Amanda Fricker. But like it's almost not false is the way he put it hmm. so like basically no the, maybe slightly putting words in his mouth basically no one did it before her and she did it like the super dupery best it's like the, the beatles did not invent rock and roll by any stretch of the imagination but they bet definitely did something sort of like reasonably unique and innovative and also sort of like blew that blew the the influences that they were taking from places just to an entirely new level so so she is the beatles of feminist philosophy but we're talking about someone else right i know nothing about um mary kate mcgowan uh, essentially i was designing this reading and i find i find it's it's conceptual framework interesting um and yeah well okay so so to to try and like set this up because i don't know uh, here either to what degree it is pioneering stuff. I think uh, some of it is just putting con uh, a conceptual framework to stuff we intuitively understand. Anyway, so basically what McGowan is, set is setting up here, and I may misrepresent this slightly, so feel free to correct me in the comments. I won't read them, but you know. Uh, <laughs> the conceptual framework is you have uh, conversations, and, and any like any other social setting uh, is a uh, rule-governed activity, and by uh, rules I'm referring to, and McGowan is referring to stuff like uh, grammar and uh, uh, the the idea that you're not really supposed to insult uh, other your interlocutors. These kinds of like general rules that apply to conversations for the most part. Um, obviously, they 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 change a little bit from conversation to conversation. Obviously, if you are if you are having a conversation in Arabic, that is going to have different you know general rules from a conversation in English, but uh, the the general rule sort of uh, can be can be understood as applying to conversations generally just for our purposes here. They also are, rule government activities are also constituted by specific rules, and those are a little bit harder to explain. Uh, imagine if you will, you are playing a game of chess, and you have an idea about the general rules of the game. The knight can move like this, the rook like this, the queen like that, uh, and those those are the general rules that apply. But in the same time you have uh, uh, a general rule that you're not supposed to uh, have, you know, allow your king to be captured, I guess. That's like, that's the end of it. I mean, the, the game actually ends before that even happens, technically speaking. So, uh, yeah, if the king cannot, cannot be put in a yeah. position to get every, captured. Every, everyone loves semantics. Every, everyone loves just, just like tiny technicalities. <laughs> so that is a general rule. Um, given those, that general rule setup, you uh, have you and your opponent, in this case, 
uh, and for conversations, it's kind of, it's not necessarily so oppositional, but here we go. Uh, you and your opponent make specific moves, uh, which place pieces in specific locations uh, apart from their starting locations, right? And given those conditions, given the moves each per party has made prior to the current moment, whatever that moment is, you have the ability to uh, uh, do only certain things under those conditions, right? There are constraints that are suddenly upon you. Like you can't, you're, you can't move uh, the rook all the way to the other side of the board because there's a pawn in the way or something like that, right? Um, so yeah. Those are the, the conditions that you find yourself under and the moves you're allowed to make under those conditions can be understood as specific rules uh, within a game of chess. Likewise, if we have a conversation and I, I uh, say something that uh, suggests, well, okay, uh, McGowan's example is helpful here, although, although it's, it's, it's rudimentary. Um, well, it's helpful because it's rudimentary, I'm not like, disparaging it there. Anyway, if I talk about the house, by which in context, it's clear that I mean my house, then you know going forward that the phrase the house is referring to my house until otherwise is somehow established. That understanding on your part is a presupposition, is the, is the vocab term here. Uh, without any like I'm trying not to, to attach any like pejoratives to that. I think presupposition is sometimes taken to be, oh, you know, you're just making assumptions. Um, McGowan doesn't mean that by this. Uh, it's and neither do uh, feminist philosophers who, who build on her work. Rather, a, a presupposition is just a thing that you know given what has been said up to now. And no, by no, what what I mean basically is like inferred. Uh, something you infer from from the uh, uh, logical content of what is said, or something you infer. Uh, from the tone, maybe of what is said, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's stuff that you that you find out that uh, you're, or stuff that you establish by a convention through what is said. Sometimes directly, in the sense that you know, if I refer to, uh, you know, I have to I have to uh, go somewhere to uh, pick up my sister. I have given you reason to infer, though indirectly, that I have at least one sibling, right? Furthermore, at least one sister. Uh, these are inferences you could make, and they're quite, I mean, obvious, right? Uh, but the point is I didn't directly say them. They are presuppositions that have been introduced into the, into the conversational, you know, body of knowledge. And, and we can understand that as like a, like a scoreboard at a game, it can, which, is, which is said to contain the, the various uh, things that are understood by the interlocutors in this conversation. So, okay, having set that up, you have, when you, uh, you, you build specific rules out of the general rules using these presuppositions, right? And what McGowan's claim is, is that once given that condition, sometimes saying things is, is doing things in that doing, uh, uh, say, to say a thing adds presuppositions to the conversational scoreboard. So would, would now be a good time to interrupt William. Yeah. Um, I just did a little searching on my computer and it turns out, um, yes, I did read this one and did a, a journal entry on it. So I will be passively looking back, back, back through that to, to be, be contributing here. Um, but it was in what, what I have labeled in here under my folder as the second half of journals. So I guess just okay. the cutoff change or something. I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, I'm like, yeah, no, I definitely read this, but I just confirmed. Huzzah! Continue. <laughs> Huzzah! Both of us have done that. Um, no, it's okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, as, as, you, as you are reminded of that, please feel free to, like, go, you know, double back onto something that I, I, I mentioned but blew past or, or failed to mention that goes somewhere else, uh, because I may not represent this perfectly. Probably not, in fact, because it's basically, again, I think a lot of it is putting words to our intuitive understandings of things. Like, I have for years been sort of careful about the kinds of presuppositions I introduce into conversations, but I have not been, you know, cognizant that they are called presuppositions, for example. So anyway, yeah, having set that up, like, you have the ability of, of words to do actions, and the actions are introducing presuppositions into the conversational score. Uh, Given that, it is possible, it seems to be, and this is McGowan's contention, it is, it is possible to do oppressive, oppressive speech just in that you introduce 
uh, the speech introduces oppressive uh, norms and, and rather presuppositions into the conversational score. Uh, so I, I, I let me scroll, through, uh, see if I can find a, one of the specific examples McGowan gives just in sort of indented form uh, because it's not gonna be, I may not, I, the one I have in mind is not ideal. Okay, yes, the, the one I have in mind is not ideal. What, what, uh, what one do you have in mind? Because I have in my notes, she, like like a hypothetical example of um, like a, a, a racist society, wherever um, you know, a white person says split, no non-white oh, person can talk. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that establishes it. That's that's a uh, that's okay. That that takes it in a slightly different direction from where I was going, but we'll I think we'll end up in a good place too. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, if you if you would uh, 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 give that example as you as you remember it, um, I may be able to find it here. Well, and possibly um, add something. Re but yeah, re remember it is um, rather charitable. I'll just go ahead and read what I turned in. Nice. Uh, for points? a fictional for a fictional example, she imagines a racist society where whenever a white person says "split," no non-white person can talk. In this society, a white person saying split is in and of itself oppressive as it makes it so that non-white people in this racist society do not have permission to speak in that given conversation. Um, and so, like, b basically, if, you know, like, I, I think the sort of analogous thing to be in here it, is, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, but, like, at least an idea maybe adjacent to what she's going to is, you know, racist and sexist remarks are in and of themselves racist and sexist but they do seem to have the function in the real world of kind of shutting out marginalized voices or sending the the message to them that they're not welcome i don't know is that did, did i steal your thunder william was that where we were supposed to end up that can definitely be an effect. I think um, McGowan would start just before then, right? Where you have uh, you have like you have you have speech that introduces. Okay, somebody says um, here's a, here's a good example. Let's say I would we you and I were talking, and there was like a third person in the room. The interesting thing about there being a third party somewhere is that the third party has access to the conversational scoreboard and that's it. Like a someone listening in, someone eavesdropping, let's say, I don't know, or, or maybe just like somebody else who happens to be there at the same time if we're in like a, a classroom or something, has access to the conversational scoreboard because the conversational scoreboard is just the set of things that you could infer uh, from the conversation about what the two people and however many people really, but two people having the conversation believe. So. If I, if I say a thing uh, that to the effect that I have, you know, I have to, I have to go pick up my sister, uh, the fact that I have a sibling and furthermore a sister is uh, part of the conversational score, whether or not my interlocutor knows that because some third party having heard it, uh, having heard me say that would make that inference easily, right? Uh, and, and, and in that vein, it's important to understand that this is all very culturally, um, embedded like it, it, you could you wouldn't take the same it wouldn't be the same general rules or ways of influencing the specific rules if you had a, a, a different set of cultural conceits like if I could have if if it were very common to um uh refer to nuns who to whom I have some kind of close relationship as my sister then that would not necessarily be a reasonable inference but it, it is a reasonable inference in like real world cases uh, as I understand them now I don't know maybe people do say something like that Regardless, uh, so that there is a third, there being like third parties um, that are privy to uh, the conversational scoreboard is sort of an important conceit here because that is where some of the, the oppressive effects takes place. Before that, however, if I were to say something uh, to the, if I, if, 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 hmm, if we were having a conversation and I referred to something like, like this pejoratively, that's gay. We've all been in middle school. We remember that. Uh, <laughs> it happened all the time. What I have done there is uh, I have, without influencing anyone else's beliefs about anything, I have, or at least outside of the conversational scoreboard, I have introduced a presupposition into the conversational scoreboard that being gay is bad, that it is furthermore permissible to say that, uh, uh, that 
things are gay in that pejorative way. I have introduced the com into the conversation this idea that um, there is something wrong with being gay by association with things that I think are bad, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have changed the rules about, permiss about what is permissible uh, in the conversation, at least if my presupposition goes unchallenged, if nobody says anything to the effect that uh, the conversational scoreboard now includes like disagreements about those that prior presupposition. I think that's actually gotten into in a, in a, in a later reading than McGowan, but I, <laughs> you know, um, the idea here is that that by itself is, is an action which cause, which doesn't need to cause any effect just uh, in, indirectly, or it doesn't, it doesn't need to influence anybody's belief about anything. It is, it is an action in itself. And because it, it, uh, it targets, targets a marginalized community for uh, disadvantage and repression, it is an oppressive speech act. Um, so yeah, we can, we can talk as well like about uh, the ethics of that, like what, to what extent you are responsible for doing oppressive speech acts, given that we, that's, that kind of stuff is culturally embedded, um, especially, I mean, especially the example of, of calling things that are bad gay or retarded. There's, there's a lot there that happens quite unintentionally, so it's unclear exactly uh, to what extent one can be sort of responsible for that stuff. I don't really have hard opinions on that just yet. I think it's I think it's more worthy to like understand the full dynamic of what's going on than to understand it in just such a way as allows you to place blame on people for stuff. But it I, I mean it, I yeah. have a I, I I have something of a hard opinion in that regard. Throw it in. You're on record. <laughs> Having a hard opinion in that regard is real dumb. I should use better language than that. And we're all talking about these things. Having a hard opinion on something like that shows a fundamental lack of understanding of the complexity of moral blame, particularly when dealing with, you know, the influence you have and the influence had on you of societal systems. Yeah. Put in more simple terms, it's not just that, oh, man, this is a really sort of complicated issue that I don't really have hard opinions on. You shouldn't have hard opinions on it because I don't, I don't mean to say that like, oh, well, it's, it's, it's complicated because like, yeah, you bear some, but not all of there. But like the, the and, and then just sort of leave it there. But the sort of idea itself, I think it just sort of makes sense to leave it sort of deliberately vague or like deliberately axiom or formula less, if that makes sense. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, to, to broaden that even further, it seems like a lot of what, how we understand, and I've read long pieces like from metaphysics on this kind of this, on this idea. Uh, a lot of how we understand blame just culturally at least is, is individualistic. You want to find a, a person to you know hold a person responsible for that person's actions and so the pitfalls come quickly when we realize that there isn't really a separation of individual from society at the deepest level um but uh, that's that is actually that's that's deeply related but um uh, let me uh, uh uh backtrack slightly to this point the the idea is that you can you can do an oppressive speech act um just by uh, uh, introducing an oppressive premise or presupposition into the conversational scoreboard, which exists as sort of an abstract entity, but is formed up of the kinds of things that would be understood by a third party listening in on the conversation and understanding it in the in its cultural context, right? Ergo, my saying like, oh, that's, that's retarded is an oppressive speech act by virtue of it be uh, introducing this oppressive um, uh, subtext into the into the conversation. Uh, it also that has the further effect that Daniel was talking about. Like if somebody if somebody with a cognitive disability walks into the room and hears that phrasing, and it goes unchallenged, that's a crucial point. Like it, it, nobody nobody says anything against it. Then as far as that person with a cognitive disability is is prepared to know, like, just uh, as a matter of epistemic uh, reality. Everyone in the room, everyone in on this conversation believes that there is something wrong with people who have cognitive, like there's something more, there's a moral shortcoming embedded in that, such that 
being retarded is associated with being bad. Likewise, for somebody who is who is queer, walks into the room, someone says, "Oh no, that's gay," uh, <laughs> in in a pejorative way. But I've 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 heard this done in a in a non pejorative way too. Uh, but, oh yeah, no these these yeah. things go all sorts of the way. I have used, I mean, like personally myself, I'm on the autism spectrum. I have used the term autistic pejoratively, and I have used it in like the highest compliment possible like someone makes this this most just sort of like niche obscure abstract odd social media posts and i am just in awe of it and will stand forever a-w-e-t-i-s <laughs> um, yeah so that yeah so again this is all like sort of culturally embedded and actually i'm gonna i'm gonna try to return to that uh idea because it's uh, that 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 cultural um dependency of it is, is important, I think. But uh, for, for now, like, it, it is worthy to, to, to make note of the fact that, like, yeah, the, the, the Oppressive Speech Act doesn't just constitute an act of oppression by virtue of its effect on the conversational scoreboard. It also, const it also can cause oppression by virtue of uh, being a, a disadvantage or, or uh, yeah, a disadvantage of some kind, even if it's just emotional, uh, to a marginalized person who hears this conversation uh, directly or is subject to the the social atmosphere in which that conversation takes place which caused you know that conversation to go the way it did you know in some way um, it can it can perpetuate a uh, uh, marginalization of people it can uh, cause marginalization of people more directly and it can just straight up be marginalization of, of some people uh, uh, yeah uh, in, 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 in its in the speech act effects on the conversational scoreboard. So that's like the concept that I'm that I'm trying to work with here. Um, but the, the the challenge that I want to make is that well if I were saying if I were like saying words in a vacuum, right? Outside removed from a or like with prior social context, as in I was raised somewhere with some people, but there weren't any people around. If I were to say some stuff that constituted as a pr oppressive speech, theoretically, that seems to have no way of, of exercising oppression on someone, right? Because I can have like a conversation with my, you know, I guess my internal monologue. <laughs> um, I, don't, I, 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 don't, I don't experience like multiple personalities or anything, but I do definitely talk to myself on occasion, if that wasn't clear by the fact that I talk so very much. Uh, the, the, yeah, the rule governed system seems to be in place just because I understand at that, you know, uh, talking to myself in similar light to conversations because my brain is built to converse where social species most of our brains are. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can seemingly introduce um, the same kinds of, of presuppositions into that, you know, self conversation, I guess, without oppressing anybody just because there's no one around to follow the rules. Likewise, it seems like there's no, uh, if, if people disagree on the rule set, uh, if, if, if somebody uh, who, to whom I'm talking, like, doesn't know the language that I know, or at least not in the way that I know, like, associate something different with the vocab term that I use, that is supposedly oppressive speech, uh, then that other person will not obviously make the inference. And if I'm alone using the vocab term in this way, it seems like a third party couldn't either, right? So if I said uh, uh, that's Rognak, and what I meant by that is some like some uh, uh, pejorative term that also applies to a marginalized community, but no one knew what I meant, including any hypothetical third party, then there could be, it seems like there couldn't reasonably be said to be like oppressive speech there. So what I'm thinking about is, is that it seems like to, in order to add something to the conversational scoreboard, there has to be uh, agreement from other parties, right? There has to be uh, uh, rule sets in the forms, in forms like grammar. And there has to be, there have to be specific rule sets and, and understanding, a mutual understanding of how the specific rules can change, how the permissibility uh, uh, facts in the conversation can change. Uh, and if there isn't that agreement, if people don't agree to you know, follow this, this rule, these rules in this way, 
and, 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 and so on down the line, um, then it seems like the, the Oppressive Speech Act just doesn't obtain no matter what I say uh, or no matter what, what anybody says. Um, that's why like we can, we can challenge, like we can, we can you know, take uh, a presupposition that is on the scoreboard and effectively remove it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because there's, 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 mutualistic, uh, uh, there's a mutualistic dynamic to this. So it seems like uh, just at the, at the uh, basic level, maybe it's even semantics, but it seems like speech can't do anything by itself. Like there needs to be, uh, it needs to be speech in a social context that is a rule, a, a, uh, an agreed upon uh, rule governed system, such as a conversation or a workplace or whatever it is. Uh, and in that case, we would, we would you know, be better served by saying that speech doesn't do anything by itself, rather uh, people do stuff with speech. And to some extent, you know, they're, it, it, they're not like culpable for having done that, but it's still a thing that is done on, on you know, uh, the side of things that is neither abstract nor uh, internal to the speaker. It has to be something, you have to have people in the room he, you know, uh, hearing your speech or reading your speech and making inferences based on it in order for it to even accomplish the thing which McGowan claims is constituting an act of oppression. Um, and this is like, I, am I on to anything there is what I mean to like to try and tease um, out here. So is, that, here's, is that the case or, yeah. Here, here's sort of, and you can tell me if I'm sort of missing the point here, sort of, sort of what, what, what's on my mind. <laughs> like, McGowan's point is is that you know like um, oppressive speech acts are you know that 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 you know they they they're not just like bad themselves but they do this other further bad thing with language you know or, or, or they when interacting with the the, the conversational scorecard etc etc yeah. um what I would put forth is um. If let if you know, let's just say I invent a slur. I didn't slur right now. A fleur. There we go. A fleur. Whatever the the hell that that is. It it's a slur in my own. It's a my own made up word in my own made up language. But it, and it means something really, really just unbelievably bad about I don't um uh people from Utah. There we go. We're going to pick on Utah. I'm also LDS, so we're always going to pick on Utah. Um, just, just, just really, really just a terrible thing about people from Utah. But no one knows what hell I just said. Um, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to pretend that I'm just like absolutely crushing philosophy of language right now, but like, I don't, I, I don't know that there's, terribly much notion for the idea that language is not public like you know there there we, we've talked a little bit about like like some notions of like meaning maybe being private and there's different theories about what sort of constitutes meaning but like language is inherently a social interaction thing and so basically where i'm culminating here is that my made think the blur or whatever nonsense sound i i did there that i'm unable to perfectly emulate that like even though I intend like hey this is a made up slur in my head like I think what you have or my intuition would be that like that's not an oppressive speech act because it can't be due to this connective tissue and so there's not this break about you know like an oppressive speech act that doesn't also do the second thing that McGowan talks about because it's not an oppressive speech act in the first place it can't be oppressive no one knows what the hell you mean yeah okay. <laughs> So that's that's interesting. Like uh, so so the uh, to be a speech. I, I guess the conceit we arrive at then is like, or the conclusion we arrive at is like, in uh, in order to be a speech act at all, in order to be speech in in the meaningful sense of, of being language that conveys meaning, it has to do this thing of conveying meaning. It has to uh, have this this social um, surrounding. Uh, it has to be it has to be it has to take place in the broader. Uh, uh, agreed upon rule set that is like a language or a dialect within a language, whatever it happens to be, uh, and we can we can make it more or less specific. Um, I think without losing anything conceptual. In that sense, then then like 
um, the the example of like talking to myself would be would be would might still throw this off slightly, but we could adjust it to say um, that you know in order to have this like this couching in a uh, the agreed upon rule set that is language, there do have to be other people involved. Like there have to be other people um, uh, to to understand it at least hypothetically in order for it to be uh, a speech act in the in the in a meaningful sense. Um, which could answer my question here. Like, yeah, the the rules can be changed and they can be disagreed about. And and some of those rules are just what words mean in context. Uh, but if I'll, I'll, if there is disagreement there, then that compromises like not whether or not a speech act is an action in the meaningful sense, but whether it is speech in the meaningful sense. Uh, I, I, I sort of have this, maybe something like this kind of in my mind. If you're sort of using your own kind of like, it, it might well be the case that in your, in the conversational scorecard in your own head, you know, the blur did, you know, meaningfully, you know, do, do the thing. But it, it, it's basically analogous to like, hey, you're totally cheating at your imaginary game of basketball where you're totally pwning Michael Jordan one-on-one. -on -one. It's like, yes, I am pwning imaginary Michael Jordan at the hoop in my own backyard where I get to enforce, make up all the rules and get to do over all the shots that I get to do everything like that. You're, you're the only one playing your game. And yeah, other hypothetical agents, if they were playing your game, yeah, would be getting the short end of the stick. But like, you're, you're, I was going to say you're playing with yourself. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, here's yeah, um, something. My face is just the to fur of a lone face. But um, here's something I sort of um, got out on my mind. And by sort of got on my mind, I, again, mean the thing that I wrote down and turned in for, for credit is sort <laughs> of my, my response here. Uh, this is good. I'm loving going back and go. This philosophy and feminism was the best class. It's interesting. Um, um, but I like noted that that she sort of like went over like the the response that like well you know the, these things are because you you've said multiple times here like you know if it's not reversed if it's not immediately challenged and you know the response would be like well like you know the, these things are you know pretty easy to to challenge and um she responds to that notion in at least in my notes here basically was sort of two points one it might not actually be the case that they're so especially sort of the more covert ones are so easy to challenge or refute or undo and that um and that even if they are in that sort of time period before they're undone that they still cause you know this this effect even if this effect is you know pretty quickly reversed um i don't i i just think she's not not wrong but sort of overstating the severity of the problem in regards to her second response there if they're really in fact that dang easy to reverse then this is um this is classically making mountains out of molehills and i don't think that's too controversial but the thing that i sort of want to pick your your brain about like is are these things actually reversible and i I'll, I'll go back to something i said i said earlier here I described something as dumb and then immediately correcting myself, you know, just a, one attempting to be a little bit better and two, to be like, dude, you are talking to the president of the disabled and non-disabled alliance. Let's, let's <laughs> actively a you know, audience awareness, actively aim to be like as non-ableist in our language as possible you're trying to do it anyway but particularly put on a good face now that's its own <laughs> separate shitty mentality that i just that i just had there but like most people like are not going to be receptive at least in my experience but you let me you i mean you would know more stories and have heard more experiences than me and everything um are not going to be too terribly receptive to the notion that dumb is ableist language. That's going to be a long and tedious conversation or a immediately ignored and shut down one and thus sort of future 
opportunities for conversations you have, you know, kind of go away because, you know, you're one of those uptight, you know, mind my pronouns types, you know, the, 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 that sort of like lazy kind of thing in there, but it is sort of the reality. And so that's sort of what I wanted to, to pick your brain about, particularly with, you know, because like if, if someone comes in and drops the N word, it's <laughs> not a terribly big ask of particularly people like us to say, dude, what the hell? No. That's just not a big ask. And it's like, like, like what to, it's not a big ask and what to do. The bare minimum of what to do is pretty clear and how to go about doing it is pretty clear. But with sort of a case like using dumb or lame or, you know, word words like that, um, I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts there? Uh, I'm going to try, I'm going to take those, those idea. I, I, I perceive at the moment, uh, two, two distinct lines of reasoning to, to pursue there. Um, I'm going to try and take them in reverse order in a way that I hope winds up being coherent. Okay. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Uh, so yeah, with regard to like ableist language, the problem with like ableist language is that a lot of it is that like, when we want to discover, when we want to say that anything is, is bad without using the word bad. Or with a, uh, if, an, if we want to say anything is deficient, if we want to say anything is um, uh, mockable, uh, yeah, if, yeah. If we want to say anything is bad, um, in, a, in, a, in in some sense that is not like the clinical technical one that I tend to prefer, <laughs> um, then we want to, then we naturally, like culturally, want to use the terms like uh, dumb and lame and stupid and and, and et cetera, et cetera, and. For the most part, like even in disabled communities of which I've I've been somewhat privy, uh, and I don't mean to say that I'm like part of this community so much, but like yeah, uh, I've I've been in on those conversations a little bit. Those that, that vocabulary still holds, like that vernacular is still in effect, um, even amongst the people to whom it hypothetically applies, whom it hypothetically marginalizes, which suggests in itself, and this could be this is vulnerable, but like suggests. Uh, that it no longer, or in those contexts, it doesn't function as uh, oppressive speech. So that's that's the that's the uh, the role of context, right? The role of like uh, social norms, the role of the the rules, and their needing to be mutually agreed upon in order for for uh, speech to be uh, to act in the way that we want it to act to be an oppressive speech act. Like we want it to act. No, no, no. Uh, so yeah, like uh, it it, uh, it might still actually be that way, but in order to uh, to to be oppressive speech in the in, on on McGowan's model that I think is expanded further in 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 more recent feminist philosophy, but I'll I'll take it for now. Um, in order to to be an oppressive speech act, it has to change the permissibility facts uh, of the conversation. It has to ch it has to change these specific facts, right? Uh -huh. And uh, that is to say that in order for uh, it to be an oppressive speech act, people have to respond to it in, in such a way as to like make the conversation, uh, at least in that time and place, uh, oppressive more generally, right? Um, which is, so yeah, that, that gives some, some sense to when in some contexts people say the N word and that's prob and that's, uh, some of the most oppressive speech that there is. It, it immediately changes the, uh, or its intent, at least it's hypothetically would, uh, change the permissibility facts of the conversation such that now it is car blanche permissible to uh, derogate uh, Black people and call them all, the, all the, the worst things we can because we've already called them theoretically uh, the worst thing. But in other contexts, if it's a, if it's a room full of, of Black people who like, let's say know each other, let's say this is like a family or something, then conceptual, uh, conceivably, and, and I would say even, even relatively commonly, uh, saying the N-word like loud and proud is perfectly fine in terms of it being an oppressive speech act because it, it, no, it doesn't function that way. It doesn't, change it doesn't change the rules of permissibility to say that suddenly it is okay to uh, sincerely derogate black people. I mean, it, it, you know, the derogation takes place in some vernacular way, but it doesn't, it's not present in the conversational scoreboard because nobody's making the, the inference uh, in that way. Yeah. I, I will just interrupt and say, yeah. um, 
if you hypothetical listener are um African American or particularly an <laughs> African American philosopher, if there was any any subtle little like ooh that should have been phrased better, like he, like we, we we will read that comment. We will read that comment particularly, and we will make that correction. I just sort of want to get that on there because like uh, it seems like. Seems like it, it, it sort of struck like the, the the two white guys are speaking pretty confidently about the philosophical status of the usage of the N word, and I just sort of want to throw that 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 general caveat in there, like, well, in case we are missing something. Go on. Yeah, it's it's totally possible to like to get this kind of thing wrong, and and I think I I hope that what turns out to be important in the moral sense is that we are willing to to uh, and I'm certainly willing to like go in and make and make that that amendment. Uh, still, like the the uh, the the context the context sensitivity of oppressive speech is what I mean to sort of highlight here or try to, um, yes. and in that sense, like when you hear the N word in a in a in a, in a hip hop song of some kind, usually it's not sincerely derogative. Like it's sort of it's it, it's it's sort of used in a way that could be inferred in that way, but you kind of know based on who's saying it and the broader context of it being like a, a song in this genre that it doesn't function that way. It's not intended to function that way and it, and it, and it doesn't to uh, any of the listeners uh, who are like relevant to them. Um, and in the same way, in some contexts, uh, uh, dumb would be ableist speech and others not so much just by virtue of it doesn't change the permissibility facts in the conversation going forward such that that conversation is oppressive. Now. Um, it, doesn't need, it doesn't even need to be challenged in order for those for oppressive um, uh, presuppositions to get removed from the scoreboard. It just, it just doesn't add them in the first place because the people in it, uh, in this uh, rule governed activity do not uh, agree to the rules that would make it oppressive speech. Ultimately, um, so that's like that's the idea. The, the, the context sensitivity is is is, is um, what we highlighted there. And over time, I think the vernacular itself likely is going to change. We're going to start describe. I don't know. In an ideal future, sometime in in the, in the far future, we're going to to describe things as like Trumpian when we want to say that they're that they're deficient or wrongheaded in some way. Um, just because that seems the the it's a non ableist vernacular, at least as far as anyone knows, and um, it doesn't. Uh, it, it doesn't, it, uh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't even like hypothetically function to, to um, uh, derogate anybody except somebody who absolutely deserves it. So yeah, there you go. Uh, there's, there's, there's ways to change, speech changes over time. But we were talking also, uh, I think, I think one of the points you mentioned is about um, the sort of accountability of, of, of uh, doing oppressive speech or of failing to challenge oppressive speech when it happens um, in, in certain settings over others. Yeah. Just and what I want to say about that is like, the I uh, I can't remember if you brought in a specific case, so I may I may parrot it. But in let's say that your uh, that that you know Vladimir Putin says some oppressive speech, as he frequently does. Um, if you you know there are ways of like challenging that um, that are perfectly good and 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 healthy to you to do. If you are in like the you know room with your Russian family or something, and some of them are at risk of sort of buying into the premises that he's surreptitiously setting up, uh, then you can, you can sort of challenge that speech right there um, very directly, very forwardly, and say, hey, that, uh, I, you, we should reject that framing because that's not true of, say, Ukrainians. <laughs> that's not true of NATO, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you can uh, clarify it right there. But if you're a journalist and you want to ch openly challenge uh, uh, oppressive speech uh, on the part of Putin, and if you are in Russia trying to do it, then that poses a problem. There's a pretty good chance that if you go through with challenging it from your platform, you will be literally poisoned. And I mean, it's not, it's, a, it's, 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 it's way further from zero than you'd like it to be. I don't know if the majority or even the plurality of like journalists uh, who, who oppose Putin get like poisoned or anything. But it has happened in, in notable cases and several of them. So that is a setting in which uh, a, a dynamic of power that pertains to the, to the context uh, is such that really challenging oppressive speech is not doable meaningfully. I mean, you could, 
but it would be it would be putting yourself at, at at significant risk. And therefore, I think most ethical philosophers would like to say that you are not responsible for letting it go unchallenged uh, in that way. Derogatory. Um, yeah. The uh, had to you had to use the fancy philosopher term there. Derogatory. Super erogatory. Oh, I actually don't know that one. <laughs> this is just the like the above and beyond. It's the charge made of utilitarianism. It's the fancy philosopher term for you know things that are above and beyond morally. Nice. Uh, okay. Cool. It did, uh, mm. As opposed to oblig, obli, obligatory, they're 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 super. You see, super erogatory. Oh. They're they're okay, cool. they're they're the next tier. This is an educational podcast, even though it's a YouTube video and not a podcast. <laughs> but it's it's two white dudes talking about how they see the world. This is a podcast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's 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 in a sense a podcast. Um. <laughs> It's a podcast in the pejorative sense. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's a press of speech. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, what am I talking about? Um, so so in settings like that, there's there's this, in settings like Russia, in settings like um, there's, like if you're in a workplace and your boss says something uh, uh, to the effect that is, to, that is a press of speech, uh, you, it's, it's very difficult to sort of challenge that in a, in a way that doesn't like put yourself in danger of having a loss of income at, at down the line. I mean, bosses can't directly fire you for that kind of thing in the United States uh, for the most part, if, especially if you're a position in a union, but they can cut your hours. They can pass you over for, for promotion stuff like that. Um, so to the extent that you have a boss and that boss has some autonomy, that boss has like authority in that situation. It's very, this is actually the first thing that McGowan goes into. Like there are, uh, ways of doing oppressive speech in that they are uh, not, not not just changing permissibility facts in the conversation, they're changing permissibility facts in a workplace or in a country or in otherwise a setting where authority is broadly acknowledged, like part of the part of the rule governed sets of things, part of the part of the set of rules in the activity is that this person is to be listened to and obeyed in some sense, or, you know, this person is to be listened to and obeyed lest ye be poisoned or lest ye be, you know, uh, impoverished in some way. Um, just for, just for examples. I mean, if you're, if you were like at home and you were a child and your dad says something problematic that you understand to be problematic, very difficult to like challenge that openly um, because it's, it's, you know, your dad, it, even, even regarding, even in the absence of like uh, punitive authority of the kind that would, you know, of the, of the kind that involves the belts being uh, uh, strong. Um, even in the absence of that, your dad has like a, for the most, in most families, I think the, the dad has a kind of, uh, and any parent really, uh, has, like a, has, has a soft power to like, you know, change the permissibility facts in the household without there being any real tangible threat of like punishment or anything like that. So, so in settings like that, challenging, challenging uh, uh, oppressive speech can be uh, very difficult and oppressive speech is much easier to obtain just because again, the rule set involved incorporates um, someone's ability to enact new policy and to to create um, permissibility facts. Uh, you know that that, that pertain not just to the conversation at hand, but also to like the actions that can be undertaken by people in that real world situation. Uh, so you know, there's uh, there's different like ways of of doing repressive speech acts, but is what I mean to say. And that uh, there's different there's many different ways of challenging them, challenging them as well, which is something that we're sort of going into right now in, in philosophy and feminism, but just intuitively, I mean, asking people, what do you mean by that? Such that, you know, uh, prompts the, the speaker to maybe walk back the thing that was said or, or clarify such that the permiss the um, the presupposition is is negated in some way. Uh, or- and that's, um, yeah. that, that's actually like the, the thing I, I put down at the time. What One of the, um, responses, you know, she, that or one of the objections she considered was was just that that um specifically covert ones. So you know, we like I I have in my mind something equivalent to the idea of like microaggressions type of a thi type of a thing. Yeah. Um, you know, co that covert ones they're like sufficiently easy enough to undo that they don't um, constitute 
oppression. And um, I, I, I agree with her that, like, I don't think that that's necessarily true, but I disagreed with her that, you know, if they are, in fact, really, really easy to do, that they should nonetheless still be called called a, a oppression. But, like, I, 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 I do find it fascinating, like, very specifically with, with just the, the covert ones pinning down, like, be, because in, in some sense, like, um, particularly for, you know, people like us, like, it, it feels, it, it's really easy. Like, I, I, I don't, I, I, I know, you know, anyone listening to, you know, an extended conversation about, you know, feminist philosophy, this is not really going to, that, that this is preaching to the choir, but like, just really to, to put it out there, like, it is truly amazing when you're when you're a white man. All you really have to do a lot of times is just be like, "Hey, come on!" And then like the people will stop. I've genuinely witnessed. I'm like, "Oh, that was literally all it took." It's actually, actually in real life as easy as people tell me it is. This is amazing. But like in other respects, I I, I think she's onto something. That it's not actually that easy to to undo these these sorts of yeah, yeah, yeah. taking place in the workplace and stuff and also just because yeah. like like i don't if you challenge every single microaggression you're gonna get shut down like people aren't going to engage with you and i don't mean like oh no they won't be my friend but like a no like when there's like a like a serious error they're making that they at least to the ability of you judging the kind of person that they are, wouldn't want to make anymore, they won't listen to you. Because they've, like, emotionally and psychologically shut you out because you jump on them. Thing. And in truth, I, I, I particularly for people where, like, risk is, is more minimal for, for, it, for challenging these sorts of things, that's the, for me anyway, and I'd like to hear your, your thoughts, bounce to strike here, is how proactive do you be and that's what makes these things kind of ambiguous in terms of deal with yeah one thing that occurs is that like uh there the the you know the thing being the uh presupposition that is problematic being easy to challenge um still seems to lend itself to that to the having been oppressive speech uh uh when it was like done at least um but it's i i i do wonder i don't really think it's possible for anybody but the speaker to like uh ameliorate the the con the scoreboard completely maybe but um uh, and, and maybe the speaker can't even do it either but let's say like i i, I you uh are a, a person uh who is who is queer and you walk into a room and someone says uh, pejoratively that's gay referring to you you're just a third party listening in this conversation it's the example i brought up earlier uh if someone, some, you know, someone in the conversation, someone else in the room says, that's a problematic presupposition you introduce in this conversation and I won't have it. Assuming you understand what that means. Um, and that's another, that's another issue. The, uh, what the scorecard now Speaking says, of autism. <laughs> what the scorecard now says, I think, is that, you know, person X set, uh, uh, has a, uh, a, pejorative stereotyping view towards gay people basically and person y doesn't or you know is is an ally in some sense and you could we can talk about as well like whether or not and to what degree that's like sufficient how effective is that kind of challenge but anyway the so what is the third party to infer like what what does the scoreboard really look like is it the case that everybody needs to challenge that presupposition in order for to the scorecard to be like close to ameliorated uh or is it the case that only one person needs to by which i mean what what is the what is the third party to infer from this from this whole situation is it is it is it more reasonable to say to guess that everybody in this room except person y who challenged the presupposition agrees with the presupposition or is it reasonable to say more reasonable to say that only person X agrees with this presupposition because someone challenged it and no one challenged the challenge. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. And, and that, that can, that makes this, this, this dynamic of oppressive speech and how it happens and how it, how it can be, can it be undone? Is that even a thing in that distance? I, possible? 
I, I, I think it, I think, and I want to sort of throw a situation like this by you. This will yeah. work to towards against your, your, your concern that, you know, that, that only the speaker can sort of undo these things. Let's say, you know, you and me and a few other people are, you know, hang, are hanging out or whatever. And in walks in just like an, just an, like an objectively gorgeous lady, just objectively, like obviously eye catchingly gorgeously and some, jackass like um cat you know cat causers or just says you know any number of you know stupid things or propositions or what 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 whatever and just she's was the news. and just visibly <laughs> yeah just, for example just um uh, just, just just sort of visibly uncover and I just sort of like stare at him and I just say like with with a dry deadpan stay classy bro and people then laugh at my joke yeah. I have a Eviscerated what he has done to the conversational scorecard because I have shown even even just by like my continued like if I look more comfortable than he does after the af after that I have taken the, like like the, the he sort of proposed a rule change and I just vetoed the living daylights out of it <laughs> with a comment that's not that's you know sort of to my concern about like how many things do you challenge it's like that like not a lecture it doesn't require any sort of theoretical terms in three words i've basically been to say i've said like dude she's just walking can you chill can you have some self-control and and i don't know i i i mean i'm not obviously the, the woman in this hypothetical situation and i'm not a woman but it it does seem like i have undercut the like kind of both the like 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 the assertion of you know the the change of rules and everything and kind of like the assertion of sort of like power and like i can get away with this of of catcalling with that comment like not to this is not tooting my own horn and i'm certainly not going to tell you that i always respond this way or always do everything perfectly but i think i think other people can undercut that dynamic and that's a the the situation you outlined is one in which very quickly it seems like the whole the scorecard becomes reasonable to infer as including only one person's bigoted attitude right only one person's trying to trying to assert um, outsized power in the situation or disadvantage the other person uh, because the room laughed right everybody suddenly agrees to the new presupposition that that further that last presupposition was not acceptable here. Um, and that's so, yeah, that, that, that makes it uh, that quite efficiently, uh, although I don't, I don't, I don't uh, want to commit to the idea that it's the only way to do it, but like that, if that, that, that's a very efficient way of changing the scorecard and clarifying, right? Um, yeah. it's, it seems unlikely in a real world, real, real world case that the guy who made the comment would then apologize for it and like walk back his own contribution, but no. is that even necessary? Because at that point, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're the, th th the third party, in this case, the woman who is conventionally attractive, let's say, ha uh, you now have, you know, you know, all the tool, all the uh, uh, epistemic reasons to think that like pe that the other people in this room, the scorecard uh, looks a particular way. And, it, and that way is more inviting than it otherwise might have been, I guess. Um, and, and further, like it, it does. Uh, is it? I, I would imagine. I would speculate that it's also true that uh, when one is catcalled, it's not. It's it's deriding no matter what happens next. So it's not like you know all associated harm has been automatically undone, but some of it seems to have. Like yeah. uh, right, um, yeah, that, or at least some harm that could have obtained has not obtained. Yeah, go, going with, you know, like, um, McCown's two, you know, ways that it comes up, the, the, the initial harm of the speech act itself, that's not, that's not necessarily uh, undone. I, I'd love it if the pretty lady also started laughing and, you know, seemed, you know, subsequently unbothered. I'd be even more elated if, you know, she came up and talked to me and I got her number afterwards, but none of these are requirements. Um, none of these are sort of expectations of what, what I'm go going at at here but um the but the second part the changing of you know the the you know conversational rules and what whatever else have you the conversational scorecard that i think can be undone not the initial harm um but the the changing of the conversational harm and in truth that's like 
all I'm trying to aim to do because, like, I don't have a time machine. I can't uncat call someone. <laughs> even it, like, even like, I apologize for my idiot friend. He's an idiot. You have a good day. Even if she appreciates that, and, fr if, and frankly, I think that's worse because, like, it it's an attempt to uncat call, but it's unsuccessful. And it doesn't adjust the conversational score. I think maybe I'm being sort of too presumptuous. Maybe it leads to an issue with me and my friend, whereas I just sort of like dryly but wittily say, stay classy, bro. And even he has to admit what a idiot he is by just laughing at my amazingly dry sense of humor. That is, that is effective. That that last bit, amazingly dry sense of humor, you know, that that was me tooting my own horn. My sarcasm is great. Amazingly Dry is my new band name. <laughs> Word Opinion is my porn name. Uh, yeah, okay. So the um, one of the things, that I, and I, 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 I should say we should probably end it um, after this, after this sub-conversation um, because we're at over an hour, I think, at this point. But uh, to, to bring it, I'm going to bring it back to our discussion about epistemic injustices because I think those, or, or the dynamic which they are, are intended to highlight, um, brings in an interesting idea about the, the ways in which people can or should challenge uh, presuppositions when they're introduced, right? So here's the thing. Most of the time, when I hear something that I think is problematic or I see something that I think is problematic or I, I, you know something along those lines, what, what, what happens in my own subjective experience is I do not have, I understand intuitively that there's an issue here, but I don't know how to respond to it. Maybe it's a social thing. Maybe I'm just like, I, I just can't conceive of like how to um, respond in, in, in a way that is like socially acceptable in the moment. But as often, it's just that I lack the ability to fully articulate to myself what it is that it was wrong just there, right? Because this has just happened. This is very, even if I have those concepts somewhere in my learning, uh, I may not be able to summon them quickly enough to, to uh, properly challenge them. Which doesn't, which usually leaves me with the sense that that was intuitively wrong. I shouldn't accept it uh, in my own sort of mind, but it nevertheless gets added to the scorecard because I don't think to challenge it, right? And in, uh, in such cases where, it, rather, there will be, I think we should expect there to be cases where something is said that is, that is uh, problematic in the moral sense. And uh, uh, I think for, for uh, McGowan's case, it would be what we should what we should like aim to describe is like cases where it's problematic in the sort of um, in the sense of perpetuating or, or causing social marginalization. But I'm also thinking of like when people say things that in, that tacitly endorse cryptocurrencies or capitalism more generally. I find them to be deeply problematic. However, I don't always have the ability to like fully articulate why I find that problematic in the moment, um, and 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 therefore I, it's hard to like tr translate that uh, that sentiment into into proper verbiage even if i had those social skills and i don't really think i do so if i were somebody who just had not hadn't had that learning at all right about uh uh problem uh what is a uh, oppressive speech like how to and how to combat it and such that seems like it's it's something that has been epistemically denied me uh, and it seems like that's going to be relatively common. Like we should, we should expect that to be pretty common, that people just don't have the concepts available to challenge speech because those concepts have been systematically denied to people uh, whom they could have benefited. Which is, you know, an, an interesting like wrinkle in all of this. Like there's, when we talk about <laughs> the, the fun thing about like uh, philosophy, political philosophy and feminist philosophy generally, um, Maybe feminist philosophy more specifically. Anyway, the fun thing about it is that it winds up all kind of connecting together into a very frustrating spider web. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I want to like sort of maybe end, but, but, and you 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 can respond if you. If you yeah. respond. I, I, I'm I'm hesitant, maybe a little bit about what you're get, getting at there because I, I I worry it leans us too close to functionally saying that people who inadvertently, you know, contribute to oppress people and they don't want to oppress people, but they don't have the knowledge of how this speech does this, that they're suffering and, and 
epistemic injustice, probably a hermeneutical injustice. Um, um, and that that feels iffy. I, I'll I'll just say that that feels shaky. That sort of like the privileged class is the one suffer. It, it is is amongst those suffering an epistemic injustice. I'm. I'm hesitant, or at least I would like a little more clarity as to why that should be not a big deal or fine enough. Uh, I, I intended there to, to reference like people who uh, have sort of, okay, let me, let me put this forward. Um, if I were, if I were a member of my, well, I am uh, disabled and, and visually at least, uh, <laughs> I say at least, I don't know. Uh, the, they didn't tell me anything when I was little. <laughs> the if I hear something like that that is problematic, um, but I don't have the concepts available to me to describe why I think it is problematic, or if I don't have if I or maybe if I don't have the concepts available with me to fully articulate why, then I might not even realize that it is problematic in the moment or thereafter. Then that seems like it's it's uh, it's information that has been like denied me, and I think a further you know claim that we could make is that it has been you know, denied to me in that case, uh, because it would be to my advantage to have that information, right? Like we have a, a society that is, that, system that systemically and systematically, there's a, these are slightly different terms, uh, disadvantages people. One of the things we should expect that society to do is disadvantage them uh, 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 hermeneutically. Let's, let's, let's go with that one because it's to do with concepts. Um, th in that, in that case, I think part of Part of the, the the wrinkle that this adds is just that it's harder in such a case to make a proper challenge because you might not even realize that the that the presumption is problematic. You might incorporate it without realizing why and whether you should. Um, and in that sense, like yeah, people who are in the dominant group have it, have a, a disadvantage here. That's but it's sort of like strictly intellectual. It's like this is not a this is not a presumption that that. Uh, that you will introduce in conversations in such a way as to like marginalize yourself if you're part of the dominant group. However, if you're part of the non-dominant group, the same thing can happen and those presumptions will be problematic for you specifically, as well as like to your social identifiable group in some way. Um, and that's, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's, that's the complication I mean to introduce. Like there can be um, uh, hermeneutical injustices which take the form of people having a uh, uh, not the correct or, or, or sufficient concepts to uh, properly make a challenge. Thereafter, they sort of incorporate those those problematic presuppositions, which disadvantage themselves. It's not technically a hermeneutical injustice until unless the person involved is part of a marginalized group, and that and the human and the hermeneutical injustice is to do with that dynamic of marginalization. But there you go. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's the, that. Yeah. And that that last part is like particularly sort of the, the key that I'm getting at because like with yeah. at least how um, Fricker like puts hermeneutical injustice like you know it it's in sort of the person experiencing it but I I, I do sort of think that there's sort of a a no that there there might need to be a, a, a term for something like this but that, that that's either here or there but like it would it it, it would indeed seem seem wrong to say like. I am experiencing an injustice because I do not know that this phrase is contributing to a, someone else's oppression who is less privileged than me, and that causes me an injustice by being unable to adequately speak out to that. That feels complicated, but I think with the caveat that it's only then becomes sort of a hermeneutical injustice when it's, you know, a marginalized community makes sense. I do think there is use for like a, a hermeneutical nuisance, a hermeneutical, that's a bummer, dude. A hermeneutical, <laughs> it, like, like um, inconvenience. I, I like to think that I suffered a hermeneutical inconvenience before the word simp was introduced to the popular lexicon. Because oh, no. I don't know. No, I, I, it, yeah, it, yeah. it, it is what it is. Like, like, it describes like the sort of like, um, way in which I have ge generally talked you know to 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 women sort of my, my entire life frankly but like a, a, and you know it sort of makes sense like oh no it's, I'm not trying to like defend their honor I am just honored genuinely like so but they, I'm just honored to be in their presence like it it, it, it you know this is a 
this was a gap in the hermeneutical research that is now here. And like, it's, it's just, I was not suffering an injustice. I was <laughs> suffering an, it, a, a, sort of an inconvenience or just an inopportune, inconvenient her, hermeneutical resource. And I think uh, a similar thing here is applying to people who don't recognize certain speech acts as being oppressive towards groups that they're not belonging to, even if they totally, totally would speak out if they did recognize it. Yeah, I think... Um... I, I don't have the full story on this one, but I, I my impression has been that like feminist philosophers talk about um, the the idea the, uh, the dynamic of oppression being global in its in its application. Like everybody under a system of of oppression is in some way oppressed, including those in the dominant group. The modality is different, uh, such that. Fricker's model could still hold up here, right? Where, where it's only a hermeneutical injustice if you are uh, part of the disadvantaged group, right? Um, and, and and if the thing is to do with the disadvantaged group as well, it, uh, yeah. And it would still it would it would be true in that case too. Like uh, in a, in either in any event that uh, hermeneutical lacula can uh, may have an impact on uh, what it means to oppose problematic presuppositions when they happen. Um, so that's all. That's yeah, I'm not, I'm not committing to the idea that like um, I, I face hermeneutical injustices all the time just because I don't uh, have the, the concepts in mind um, immediately to to properly challenge stuff. What I mean is that th those those uh, conceptual gaps in understanding, which sometimes are injustices and sometimes maybe not, um, whatever, uh, which sometimes are are you know classically called hermeneutical injustices, uh, result in 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 uh, an inability to uh, properly challenged presuppositions uh, that are problematic that is not that seems to not necessarily be like the fault of the person who then fails to challenge it or even incorporates it I mean obviously you know if you if you don't know that it is wrong or why it is wrong we're just sort of built to incorporate new presuppositions uh, as like a social species so that's like that's the thing we're trying to combat here it's uh, being not cognizant of that or not sufficiently cognizant of that social dynamic is what kind of got us here, where, her, uh, where hermeneutical injustices are, are, are very common, but much more common are instances of oppressive speech. Like the entire zeitgeist is built to, for example, be ableist pretty deeply against people with like cognitive impairments um, in, in a way that's like, that's very difficult to combat even in anti, even like explicitly anti-ableist settings. So that's, that's, yeah. Um, uh, it, hermeneutical justice and hermeneutical inconveniences definitely have like a place here, but I mean to say that like part of how they fit into this broader picture is just that they, they influence how uh, how and whether and to what extent we we can you know make a make a proper challenge to presuppositions that are problematic. Uh, so yeah, sorry to um, everybody to, to to go on for uh, so very long. Uh, Daniel, do do you have any any like final thoughts you want to throw in? I think I'll give you the last word uh, on this one if you want it. Um. No, just um, it's been a been a good time. Um, I'm, I'm looking for it. I I should have it here. Yeah, no. Um, at least when I, when I took the class, you do indeed read a, a framework because you, you you said you know the the general consensus is that you know oppression is sort of in a global sense, and then it's all just sort of degrees. And we I did in fact read someone um, again arguing that that men as a class just cross over men are not oppressed um and this is not um yeah it's, it, it, it's an it's an interesting point i wound up strongly disagreeing with it and then like walking it up to like a you know just regular old di disagreeing with it but like you will uh, unless um unless the professor took this reading out or substituted it with something else of, of course due to my you know obviously amazing criticisms you know clearly that would be how this how how this would work you do read something that that you know defines oppression not globally at least not necessarily globally or not in the sense of like the only people unoppressed are like the bourgeois oligarchs the male bourgeois oligarchs <laughs> But I will leave that for for future William to to discover, and then maybe we'll we'll hop back on here because what why not do this again? Just just fantastic.
Yeah. Why not? J- j- jokes aside, I I have I I have genuinely enjoyed doing this. Awesome. Yeah. Um. I'm. I'm I'll actually. I, I said I'd give you the last word. I'm going to do a plug real quick. Uh, Daniel runs a podcast. It is called Shock and Autism. It has some associated YouTube stuff going on as well uh, that I'm sort of slightly familiar with. Um, you can find that on Spotify under Shock and Autism. Shock and Autism. I'm going to put a, a link to uh, one of the YouTube channels in the. I think the main one in the description as well. Once I upload this, uh, so go and go and check that out as well. Um, Philosophy Club is obviously here, and this is sort of the archive. Uh, and, and Shock and Autism will be over there. It's not the same stuff. I'm not gonna lie. But Daniel's also there, and he's pretty much the same person. <laughs> so there yeah. you go. We 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 haven't delved deep into feminist philosophy, but we we've delved into some deep topics. We've delved into some philosophical ideas because my my and my co-host Dylan Pokemon. has taken philosophy at least one philosophy class before. Nice. All right. Well, uh, that's you that's wanna a- you you you're gonna you're gonna plug the club you run. This is oh, that sure. uh, the philosophy club. Oh oh oh. You are right, Dana. Dana, that's uh, 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 the disabled non-disabled. I'm going to link that in the description as well. Uh, the disabled and non-disabled alliance at Sacramento State uh, is is another uh, club that I that I uh, help to run. I'm also nominally president of that one. It has a YouTube channel as well that functions as its archive. Um, it's got other social media governs. I'll link those too. Uh, why not? <laughs> Don't you all also have a podcast? We do, but it's on it's on the uh, student run. Network. If you're a student at Sacramento State and you have access to KSSU, uh, it's there. It's under uh, Through Our Lens. Uh, you can find it there. Uh, so yeah, sorry to, uh, I think it also, it also, actually it also goes on YouTube too. I, I'm just going to link all of the thing. I'm just going to find all of the hyperlinks that I that I have any access to, which is infinite hyperlinks. And I'm going to put them in the description of this video for you to parse through, Daniel, for having made, for making me go through all this. <laughs> there we go. I will, I will find all of the things and I will smash that like button. And we hope you do, dear oh, listeners, yeah. do the same. Yeah, the YouTube shit. Uh, subscribe and all that. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, that's it. We've, we've gone on forever. I will see you uh, uh, next week. There's going to be a thing that happens. Maybe it's going to, or I don't think it's going to be a YouTube video next week, but the week after that, uh, we're going to have uh, one of our professors, uh, Dr. Brandon Carey, talk about... Not the week, week after that. Not, Not the week, week after April that. 8th. He, April 8th. He, he's coming April 8th. We'll, we'll have someone, ideally. Yeah, it's, something. It surely can't <laughs> just be us talking every week. Surely not. I mean, I could. I really could. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone. And, and we're sorry. <laughs> or at least I'm sorry. <laughs>